Hello, I'm Dr. Peter Bregan. I'm an MD. I'm a psychiatrist. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the drugging of children. It's a part of my Simple Truth series. Within the Simple Truth series, I'm going to be doing a few on children. Because one of my greatest concerns and one of my wife Ginger's greatest concerns, and we work in partnership in this work, is the drugging of America's children. There's two or three or four different ways to approach this. One issue is how do the stimulant drugs that are used to treat ADHD in children work? That's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. <clears throat> Another big question is what is ADHD? Does it exist? You'd be surprised how many books now, many following my lead and articles say, no, of course it doesn't exist. Kids are hyperactive, but there's no disease. Another issue is, you know, how did this come about? How is it that 20% of high school boys are diagnosed ADHD and how probably a larger percentage than that are going to be on these drugs before they're through their youth and early adulthood? What's going on in our culture? What does it mean about family values? So there's a lot of different questions. Today I want to talk about one of the most straightforward. How do the stimulant drugs work? We're talking about uh, Ritalin, uh, which is uh, chemically methylphenidate, and Concerta and Focalin, which are similar drugs. We're talking about the amphetamines like Adderall and um, Dexedrine. The question is, why give them to children to quiet them down or to put them under control their stimulant drugs? Well, we can look directly at their effects by giving them, in regular clinical doses, to chimpanzees. What are chimps like? Chimps are a lot like little children. They like to play, they like to run around, they like to jump around, they like to climb, they like to hug, they like to kiss. They like to groom each other, and uh, probably above all things, they like to get out of the cage and escape and be doing things that normal chimps should do. Now, what happens when you give a chimp a clinical normal dose is used on children of, say, Ritalin, methylphenidate, Focalin, Concerta, Adderall, Dexedrine, one of these drugs? The first thing that happens, and you measure it in careful experimental conditions is that everything we call spontaneous behavior is reduced, sometimes to the point of crushed. So the chimps stop doing all their marvelous activities and they just sit around. They just do less. They don't try to escape their cages. They look like good caged animals. And then a second thing happens probably because of an effect on an area of the brain called the basal ganglia. They get obsessive-compulsive. So they start to play with pebbles, or they do something the children these drugs will do. They'll pull on their skin, or they'll pull out their hair, or they'll pace in a little corner, or they'll just stare straight ahead. They develop OCD. Now think about that. A teacher has an unruly kid in class because the kid is full of life, he's bored, Maybe he's even upset, can't concentrate. Maybe he's hungry, maybe he's been bullied. We don't know the reasons why maybe he's not paying attention. Maybe he's not up on the reading level. Maybe the teacher's boring, maybe the teacher's depressed. You know, we don't know necessarily why the child is not paying attention, why the child is a little jittery, or why the child's talking out of turn or interrupting, all these things that are called ADHD. But the child's doing that, and now you give him the drug, and with the first dose, the week he's back in school on the drugs, he's no longer got spontaneous behavior. Why, it's a miracle from the teacher's viewpoint, from the either the unknowing or the unscrupulous teacher. It's marvelous. Little Johnny just sits still, doesn't fidget, doesn't do anything. Now, she's not likely to come up and notice the sparks gone from his eye and that charming little smile is gone. And then she writes something on the board. And little Johnny, who never pays attention when she writes on the board, he's bearing down on the page, tearing into his paper. 
because he's become obsessive. One study at NIMH that looked really intensely at OCD in these kids found out that most of them were getting OCD and most of them were also getting ticks, both probably basal ganglia damage. Some of the kids got so obsessive that when mom would, or dad would say, rake uh, the leaves off the lawn, they'd go outside, rake all the leaves, and then they'd stand around and wait for them to fall off the trees, to rake them. Or they would just obsessively play uh, video games or watch the TV. That's much less trouble for a harassed mom and dad who don't really realize what they're doing to their children. Quite often I see parents, and I see them now after the kid's first gone on the Ritalin, and then he had adverse effect of insomnia, and they put him on a sleeping pill. Then he got depressed, because after all, if you lose your spontaneous behavior, it's like getting depressed. So they put him on an antidepressant. And by the time they come to see me, they've forgotten that, that their child was full of life and smiled and told jokes until he was put on the Ritalin or the Adderall. And then he went downhill with adverse effects. And then he went downhill with more adverse effects and more drugs and more adverse effects. It's a dreadful tale. Now, do the drugs work? Well, first of all, how long do you think Adderall XR was tested before the FDA approved it? You can actually get this information. <clears throat> just, just Google Adderall, complete prescribing information, look at the index on the front of it, tell you where to go to see the clinical studies. And the clinical studies for Adderall XR extended release were three weeks long. What does that tell you? Well, it tells you two things. It tells you the drug doesn't work, or they would have gone six weeks, eight weeks, ten weeks, twelve weeks. It also tells you the drug causes a lot of adverse effects and kids must be dropping out, otherwise they might have gone at least a little bit more than three weeks. Well, what happens in those three weeks that gets the drug approved? The crushing of spontaneous behavior and the enforcing of OCD makes the kids look better in class. And by the way, all the original studies showed that teachers thought the kids improved, but the parents didn't. Let me repeat that. The studies, and I'm going to do a separate sh simple truths on this horrendous fact and on what's happened to the children. I'm going to do a separate one following up from the 70s, what's happened to the children. It's horrible what's happened to children who've been put on these drugs. Right now, I just want to talk about this general issue. Well, for three weeks, the spontaneous behavior is crushed. It mainly shows up at school, and the parents don't necessarily see improvement at home, or they might, depending on what they want out of their children. The drug side effects, agitation, insomnia, anxiety, that's the stimulation of your nervous system. Then as the drug wears off, crashing, depression, and through the whole thing, apathy and indifference, that is loss of spontaneity, loss of involvement, OCD. In other words, the effect of the drug, the basic effect of the drug, that is the apathy and the OCD, the so-called good effect is an adverse effect along with all the others. The drugs disrupt growth hormone and therefore suppress height and weight, and that's what docs mention. Oh, well, suppressed height and weight. No, the kids don't get it back when they stop the drug. They get it back in bunches, but they don't fully recover. But that's just height and weight. Well, you see, the suppression of height and weight is from the suppression of growth hormone, not just from the suppression of appetite. It messes up the cycle of growth hormone. That's your whole body. That's your brain. In addition, since you're messing up several neurotransmitters in the brain, you're going to be causing lifelong changes in the child's brain. That means in the child's self. Children raised on stimulant drugs will never know who they really were. That's the sad truth. Now, I know that that's not good to hear. It's not, you know, it's painful to say. I don't, people don't want to hear that. I've always been reluctant to say that. I mean, there are some of you out there who are going to be saying, well, yeah, have I been changed? What we have to finally do is say the stimulant drugs don't do any good and they harm people and we have to stop using them. The drugs cause psychosis. They cause permanent tics in people. In little children, more than half will get depressed. 
Yet the American Academy of Pediatrics wants it given to little and little children because they're all involved in one way or another, directly or indirectly, with the drug companies. So what do we do about this situation? What do we do instead of drugging our kids? You know, the first thing we need to do is stop drugging them. I don't think any child should be given a stimulant drug to suppress the spontaneity and make them OCD. If we stop doing that, we'll start figuring out what we need to do. But it's not very complicated. We need to retake responsibility for our children. We need to stop injuring their brains. And by the way, I mean injuring their brains. There are multiple studies on brain damage from these drugs. Measurable shrinkage of the brain. I actually I summarize some of those studies in my most recent book, Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, and I go into much greater detail about it in some of my earlier books. The Ritland Fact Book is a good book to start with. A little more complicated. The Ritland Fact Book is a good book to start with. A little more complicated book is Talking Back to Ritland. It's just full of all the studies you need, including studies about how your child becomes more prone to cocaine addiction. Very good study on that when they grow up, and why not? Cocaine has exactly the same effects on the brain as amphetamine and methylphenidate. So folks, what do we do? We just stop this and then we think, well, what did we do before this? So what do we need to do? We need to get back to basic disciplining of our children, loving them and setting limits and taking moral authority. In, uh, in my book on the Ritland Fact Book, I devote several chapters to the key elements which are, in fact, discipline and moral authority and love. Regain your moral authority. Take responsibility for your children. Teachers, learn to teach again. Learn to control children again. Instead of taking seminars from the drug companies, take some teacher training courses on how to manage a classroom. And not with some artificial rewards and punishments. Learn how to engage children, talk to children, excite children. I've never had a child with a diagnosis of ADHD who didn't pay complete attention to me in the first five minutes of a session because I'm engaging them. I can talk to 1,500 people and not see anybody jiggling around in the audience. If I did, I'd walk up to them and ask them if they were okay. We are supposed to engage the people we teach. We're supposed to engage the people we raise. Let's get back to being parents. Let's get back to being teachers. And let's stop drugging our children. I'm going to have a lot more to say about this as we go along in my simple truths about psychiatry. Thank you.